Okay, we're going to get started. Good morning, everyone, on this uh, Wednesday morning. It is great to see you all so bright and early for the launch of a, a very historic event, the virtual launch of the Ryerson Venture Zone in Brampton, which is a partnership between Ryerson University and the city of Brampton. And, you know, I realized something this morning. We are now three quarters of the way through 2020, the year that will not leave us alone, uh, but there are some beautiful specks of hope and uh, some, some happy moments in this year. And this one, as I mentioned, is historic. And it is something that is really gonna shape the future for not only Ryerson, but also uh, the region and uh, our entire region. So I'm very excited to be here. Now, although this event is virtual, we are going to begin with something very important, a land acknowledgement. The region of Peel is part of the treaty lands and the territory of the Mississaugas of the credit. Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. It is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee uh, that uh, bound them to share the territory and to protect the land. Uh, for thousands of years, indigenous people inhabited and they cared for this land and subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, of friendship, and of respect. I am especially excited to be here today because I am a Ryerson grad, uh, and like many of you over the past decade, uh, I have been following Ryerson's Zone Learning Network, which has really uh, morphed into this uh, globally recognized uh, catalyst for innovation and for entrepreneurship. So that's why today is just such an exciting new step in that as well. Uh, Ryerson Zones, or startup incubators, are, are energetic community hubs that bring together students, entrepreneurs, industry leaders to identify and develop innovative solutions uh, to existing or emerging challenges. And we know we have those right now. It has incubated more than 3,500 startups, raising more than $750 million in funding, which is quite impressive. Today, the Ryerson Venture Zone in Brampton is the university's first zone to be located off its main campus. And what a perfect place to be located. As you may know, the city of Brampton is Canada's second fastest growing city. It has outlined an ambitious 2040 vision to transform how the city is governed, seen and celebrated. And one part of that vision you also might have heard uh, is the recently announced Innovation District. And that's going to be dedicated spaces of downtown Brampton that will foster uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. And the mayor will tell us more about that when he speaks today. Um, location, of course, is also everything, as they say. Uh, and because this is one step uh, toward positioning the city to be an innovation hub. Uh, this makes this extremely exciting because it's connecting the innovation corridor of Kitchener-Waterloo to Toronto. So Brampton's place location-wise is perfect for that. At this morning's launch, we are going to hear from leaders and in the institutional, uh, municipal, and provincial levels. We're also going to hear for some, from some local entrepreneurs as well. Uh, and uh, I won't give away too many details. I'll let uh, John McRitchie do that. He is the Assistant Vice President, Zone Learning and Strategic Initiatives at Ryerson University. Over to you, John. Great, thank you, Farah. Um, and welcome, everyone. Welcome, Mayor Brown, Minister Sarkaria, President Lashimi, and Provost Zolfagari, and everyone on, online to the launch event for the Ryerson Venture Zone in Brampton. It is great that so many have joined us this morning, so early, and we look forward to being able to welcome you in person soon in Brampton downtown. I would like to acknowledge and thank first our, uh, some of our first partners. They are critical in building the connections that needed for the ventures and entrepreneurs that we look forward to supporting. Our industry partner, Dynacare, and community partners, SE Health, AgeWell, Golden Age Valley for the elderly, and there'll be more to come, I'm sure. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the city of Brampton, as Farah has pointed out, is making this, this possible through their generous support and their investment and commitment to entrepreneurs and innovation in Brampton. The hard work of the Ryerson Venture Zone team has brought us to the, this event together today. Uh, Usha Srinivasan, who is the director of the Ryerson Venture Zone, and she's been working tirelessly, enthusiastically over since joining us in late May to get the zone up and running and get the community and partners engaged. And her team 
Nabia Norani, Marketing and Communication Specialist, and Yashin Shah, uh, our Manager for Venture Programs for uh, the Zone. And of course, the support from the rest of our team at the Office of Zone Learning, in particular, Faranzia and Carola Woods. So the Ryerson Venture Zone will be Brampton's incubator dedicated to building and growing early stage high technology, uh, potential, high potential technology startups in Brampton. Through the zone, we are going to be encouraging entrepreneurship, cultivating community and endorsing experimentation to support ideas with impact. I'd like to take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit about how we reached this point and where we are going and how to get involved. We began discussions with the city actually several years ago to establish an innovation zone in Brampton. Those plans were rolled into the proposal for a new university campus in Brampton. And although there have been some temporary bumps along that road, uh, the city and Ryerson Ring committed to establishing an, a zone to support Brampton, and entrepreneur, uh, Brampton entrepreneurs and innovators. We'll be working very closely with other organizations like the Brampton Entrepreneur Center, the Rick Center, Sheridan College's EDGE, incubator and Ryerson's Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst and I hope additional partners. You'll hear more from the mayor shortly about the city's innovation vision for downtown Brampton and for the area. From Ryerson we're bringing over 10 years of experience growing from one to now 10 innovation zones in our downtown campus in Toronto as well as initiatives in, in Canada and internationally. The best known zone is of course the DMZ, but in addition, there are nine other zones covering a wide range of industries and sectors. Over these 10 years, we've incubated over 3,500 startup teams and that, have, that they've raised $750 million in investment and support, and they've created over 4,000 jobs. So how will this work in Brampton? So the Ryerson Venture Zone in Brampton will provide incubation, vendor, mentorship, skills training, and access to networks all with the goals of accelerating the development of new ventures, creating jobs and building globally competitive entrepreneurial capacity here in Brampton and for Canada. For the entrepreneurs in the audience, this means the zone will be a place where you'll be able to build connections, particularly linking to the key sectors here in Brampton, such as health and wellness, advanced manufacturing, food processing, and logistics and transportation. We'll be focused on not only helping to build your startup, but also you as a founder to build the skills, resilience, and knowledge you need to grow and succeed. We'll be taking a data-driven approach to creating high-performance founders through our partnership with BoxArt. And we'll recognize that being a founder and an entrepreneur is hard work. It can be isolating and it can be exhausting. We'll work to put the resources in place that help you meet those challenges and be with you through that journey. We're launching, three, four, we're launching four key program areas. First will be industry challenges, working together to look at problems and solutions that can be matched to opportunities there here in Brampton. Our first industry challenge around community health and wellness launch, uh, launches uh, and today and we'll be starting to accept applications. We have a pre-incubator program focusing on the founder development, an incubator focused on the development of the startup company and building and helping it to grow and an entrepreneur residency. So the innovation and entrepreneurial skill development for talent that hopefully will be able to also support SMEs and larger companies in the communities with their personnel. We also bring access to the research capacity, talent and intellectual property of the university to accelerate the growth of your venture and build competitiveness and build a connection and other resources in Brampton and in the community you'll need to grow. Our goal is to build a funnel of startups and entrepreneurial talent that will power venture growth and job creation here in Brampton and for Canada. Find out more and connect through us, connect with us to, through our website, including information on the industry challenge at Ryerson.ca slash Brampton Zone. That's Brampton Zone, all one word. And thank you again for joining us all this morning. We look forward to working with you online and I hope very soon in person in downtown Brampton. Thank you so much, John, for that. Uh, for anyone uh, interested in learning more about the zone or its uh, inaugural challenge, you can visit ryerson.ca slash Brampton Zone. As the mayor of Brampton, Patrick Brown has spoken widely about his vision to build a Brampton's economic climate for new investments and new jobs. And as mentioned, the city has recently invested in building an innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem of which the zone will be a key player, a key component. Let's hear more. Mayor Brown, the floor is yours. 
Well, thank you, um, uh, Farah, and good morning to our Ryerson Venture Zone uh, partners, uh, fellow speakers, and honored guests. We're really excited about this in, in Brampton. I'm honored to be here today to officially welcome the Ryerson Venture Zone to our downtown Brampton Innovation District. Um, and just to say, there's a lot of enthusiasm in the city about this. Um, we're excited that you're joining us as we build our innovation district, which is our ultimate goal. These are creating the environment for the jobs of the future. Um, and frankly, we wanna create uh, support for Brampton's entre entrepreneurs at every stage of their journey. Ultimately, we wanna create an ecosystem where they can, where ideas uh, can compete, where companies and products uh, can hire talent, raise capital, and uh, create their company without having to leave the innovation district. Uh, and with your connection to the Ryerson DMZ, the world's number one university incubator, the Ryerson Venture Zone, it's, it's a key piece of our suite of support. So your presence brings us one step closer to achieving our goal, having that environment, which is an ecosystem for job creation. A few years ago, we saw a gap in the resources that existed to support our entrepreneurs and business community. We didn't have a centralized suite of resources where they could access supports they needed to start and build their businesses. And so the idea of our innovation district was born. Since then, we've developed a plan that we are committed to and we're determined to bring it to life. And we are well on our way. And although COVID-19 has impacted our ability to provide in-person services, we are continuing um, even during COVID to operate virtually. Current partners in our innovation district include our Brampton Entrepreneur Center, also known as BEC. Um, our uh, home of the hustle was the first member of the innovation district. Located in a spacious 4,500 square foot storefront, this co-working space is designed to fuel creativity, productivity, and provide small business resources. And BEC hosts frequent seminars and offers business plan reviews, consultations with advisors at no cost to local entrepreneurs and innovators. So it's a great asset to have locally. The Catalyst Cyber Accelerator led by Rogers Cybersecure Catalyst and Ryerson DMZ is Canada's first cybersecurity accelerator um, for startups and scale ups. This accelerator in conjunction with other cornerstones of the Rogers Cyber Secure Catalyst is positioning Brampton as Canada's hub for cybersecurity. And I know uh, Mohammed Lashmi was there for that opening. It was a, another real proud day uh, for the city. And it is pretty neat in our city when they had the Canada US Cybersecurity Conference. It wasn't in Washington, it wasn't in Ottawa, it was in Brampton at Lionhead. So there's something special happening with cybersecurity and technology. The Research Innovation Commercialization or RIC Center is also a specialized business incubation accelerator space which helps startups scale up and take their businesses to the next level. The RIC Center has special, specialized resources for companies working in the area of internet, internet of things, clean tech and advanced manufacturing, so a broad uh, umbrella. Of course, our Brampton Board of Trade is in the downtown as well. The Brampton uh, business Improvement Area, the BIA, is also one of our key partners building the Innovation District. And more partners are expected to join the Innovation District in the days to come, the weeks to come, and the months to come. We're very excited with the progress we're making on building our Innovation District. I can tell you how pleased I am to see the panelists mm -hmm. for today's event. Each of them got their start in Brampton, and this is what our Innovation District is all about, uh, making sure that there is uh, more of you in the years ahead. We want to hear more success stories like yours. We're so proud of Bailey Parnell, who has been named one of Canada's top 100 powerful women by women's executive network. Randy Osai is the recipient of Brampton's top 40 under 40 and is sought out by Nike HP for his work with influencers and top athletes. Nate Bagnell has secured a deal on Dragon's Den. Sobia Walia and his co-founder of uh, Kloop were inducted to the legendary Forbes 30 under 30 list. Quite an impressive roster of homegrown Brampton talent. Clearly, we keep a good company in Brampton. And I'm looking forward to hearing all of you speak today and telling your stories. Uh, um, thank you to Ryerson for choosing Brampton as a location for your venture zone. Right? Clearly, you see what we see in Brampton, and there's something special happening.
We are honored to partner with you. We look forward to adding more partners to our innovation district and working together with all of you to help produce many, many more success stories. Uh, the continued evolution of our innovation district is a key piece of our economic recovery strategy. Although our actual doors aren't wide open right now in the, in the innovation district as we continue to navigate the impacts of COVID-19, we are still here to support and we look forward to the day when we can welcome everyone back in person to our innovation district. Until then, we will continue to work virtually to support our entrepreneurs and move our economy, our economic recovery forward. Uh, and the last thing I want to say is um, one of the reasons the innovation district, the cybersecurity, the venture zone, all these great initiatives are successful is we have great collaboration between the three levels of government. I look at um, I look at what right now we're doing with the Venture Zone and Ryerson. Thank you to Prabhmeet Sarkaria, who's part of this panel for um, his uh, unwavering support. And I look at the cybersecurity um, initiative and, and the support we got from the federal government to Minister Nav Baines. And so um, we're having great success because everyone's working together, recognizing that this is a great opportunity uh, for the city of Brampton. So thank you, Ryerson, uh, and looking forward to the, to the discussion today. Thank you, Mayor Brown, for those remarks. Uh, as someone who grew up in Peel Region, I have to say I'm really excited to see what the future holds for Brampton and for the entire region. Thank you as well for that segue, because uh, our next speaker is Canadian lawyer and a politician who is currently serving as Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction for the Ministry of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Mayor Brown just mentioned his name. Uh, Prabhmeet Sakaria is the MPP for Brampton South. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Farah, for that kind of introduction, and thank you so much uh, for having me here. It's great to be back in uh, Brampton, although it's uh, virtual, and uh, uh, very excited for this uh, incredible launch that we have going uh, today. And I want to take an opportunity to really thank uh, uh, the President, uh, Mohammed Bashemi. He's got an incredible vision. Anytime I've been able to, to have a chat with him or even listen to him, it's incredible the wealth of knowledge he has, his vision, and, and really what he's done uh, with Ryerson in Brampton. So uh, thank you, President, for all of your leadership and the entire team. I'm so excited to see the panel that's here today. Uh, Sobi Wally, a great friend, great entrepreneur, and just incredible stories uh, all across uh, Brampton. It's really a great opportunity for us to highlight uh, the incredible work uh, that's being done uh, right here in our city. And, and I truly think that this is going to be a game changer for our city. And not just our city, but our economy. It's a great win for all of us. And, you know, we've really been through an undeniably difficult time and getting here really hasn't been easy. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be more tough times to come as we, uh, you know, uh, go through uh, these uh, turbulent times. But I, I think if there's any community that can really ra rally together, it's this one, it's Brampton. You know, as one of the, you know, second fastest growing cities, um, Brampton is known uh, across the province for its diversity, its dynamism, its dedication uh, to the community, whether it's, you know, the specialty shops that are lining our main streets, uh, to the unique eateries uh, anchoring our neighborhood plazas, or to our new downtown innovation district, which I really want to thank, you know, uh, Mayor, uh, His Worship Mayor Brown's uh, leadership and, and vision on. I think it's going to be incredible when we look back, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, what Brampton is today and what it's going to be um, in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And, and a lot of that credit will go to Mayor Brown and his vision for that innovation district, as well as anchor partners like Ryerson. I think, you know, Brampton has always been filled with thriving small businesses, entrepreneurs training a bus, um, catering to community and really trying to put us on the map. And I think these businesses are truly the heartbeat or lo of our local economy for as long as I can remember. And from a government perspective, as my portfolio is in small business, um, it's my opportunity to work with stakeholders, work with organizations like Ryerson in the city of Brampton to really ensure that we uh, restore them to, to the best opportunity uh, possible. And that's really why I'm so excited about this program. You know, Brampton's new venture zone um, is gonna do an incredible job of promoting you know, tech-enabled innovation uh, across industries and the leadership behind this uh, innovation zone is going to be incredible to what they offer this city truly um, a leading uh, I think uh, innovation zone across the country you know whether it's the main street shop uh, a b2b outfit or an ai startup I think we all want entrepreneurs to have the support they need to recover 
relaunch and grow now, especially more than ever. The government has been working on some really neat projects, whether it's been the intellectual property action plan, you know, with the hope of really trying to keep more innovative technology solutions at home, you know, developing businesses and helping people across the province. It's a made in Ontario approach, but I think it's very critical when we have venture zones like this uh, uh, led by Ryerson to also really understand the IP impact and to ensure um, that uh, the startups harness IP value for economic benefit in the future. I think, you know, to encourage businesses, we all need to support Ontario developed projects, Ontario technologies, and really support Ontario made now more than ever as we come out of these very turbulent times. I think by really promoting Ontario products, Ontario companies, Ontario Innovation Zone, we're going to help spotlight, uh, shed a spotlight to Ontario's ingenuity, you know, strengthen our supply chains, and really boost the growth of Ontario businesses across sectors. You know, whether there's going to be a ton of work uh, you know, to be done still. I'm really confident that, that Ryerson's Venture Zone will help position more of Brampton's innovative entrepreneurs and small businesses for success, not only in today's economy, but the future economy, tomorrow's economy. And as we take our next steps on the path to recovery and renewal, I'm sure we'll see many of them lead the way. So, uh, you know, just with that, I want to thank the entire team for Ryerson uh, for the incredible work that they have done uh, for bringing this uh, real, uh, making this a reality uh, for Brampton uh, and incredibly proud that it's happening in our home city and really look forward to what this will bring uh, from an economic standpoint to our province and also to the economy of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for those words. Uh, we appreciate, uh, of course, your, your continued support for local and small businesses. Uh, and next, I would like to introduce the man, as uh, Minister Sakaria said, with the vision, uh, Mohamed Lashami is the President and Vice Chancellor of Ryerson University, who is going to share more about, again, the vision behind the zone uh, and the zone learning and the zone's presence in the city of Brampton. Over to you. Good morning and uh, thank you, Farah. And I want to uh, thank Mayor Brown, uh, uh, the mayor and council, uh, our wonderful partners. And also a uh, big thank you to uh, uh, great friend, Minister uh, Sakarian for his support and the support of the uh, provincial government for all the work and their way in, in Brampton. And also the great support from uh, uh, all local uh, members of parliament in Ottawa from Brampton. Uh, they have been really championing all the work that we have been doing there in Brampton for a number of years. Um, about five years ago, uh, Premier Davis uh, called me to talk about bringing Ryerson's experience with innovation and entrepreneurship to uh, Brampton. Um, I personally live in uh, region uh, or the Peel region, so I know how much the area has to offer. Uh, so right from the uh, start, it was clear that uh, Brampton and uh, Ryerson had the makings of a great partnership. And uh, I remember after that call with uh, uh, Premier um, Davis, uh, I had a very uh, uh, good conversation with the uh, Blue uh, Ribbon panel and that actually conversation was almost exactly five years ago, uh, second week of uh, September 2015. And we started that journey to, uh, together. So uh, uh, we have uh, uh, much in common, uh, young, diverse population, uh, community and leadership that looks uh, to the future. And uh, most important thing is a willingness to transform ourselves to keep pace with the changing world. And we all know what's happening these days with the pandemic. I think this is an opportunity for uh, us. Uh, and I'm talking here about uh, the work that we are doing in Brampton, really to push boundaries and uh, um, see what are the opportunities that are there uh, out of the challenges that we are experiencing. Uh, Premier Davis uh, said to me, I have seen what Ryerson has done in downtown Toronto and I want this to happen in, in, in Brampton. 
my city. I think we all know how Premier uh, Davis is proud uh, to be from uh, Brampton. Uh, he liked how our university uh, was transforming the core of uh, downtown Toronto, uh, helping to attract the uh, right kind of growth and development. How does that happen? By supporting innovation and entrepreneur uh, and engaging entrepreneurship. Uh, team such Ryerson and Brampton began uh, working together. As a result, last year, uh, as mentioned by uh, Mayor Brown, we opened the uh, Ryerson's, uh, the Rogers uh, Cyber Secure Catalyst a national center focused on the challenges and opportunities in cybersecurity. And I still remember that discussion with the uh, Blue Ribbon panel. Uh, we told them that uh, Ryerson is really uh, interested to engage in partnership with Brampton, but let's think out of the box. Let's think about things that will be important for the future of the city, but also important for the uh, future of our country. And I think the cyber piece um, shows that when you think out of the box, you can bring solutions, but you also you can um, make Brampton, as mentioned by Mayor Brampton, as the center uh, for uh, the cybersecurity uh, solutions that we are all facing. And today I'm delighted to uh, help launch the uh, Ryerson Venture Zone, a hub for innovation and entrepreneurship uh, for the community. Why is Ryerson collaborating on this kind of project? We recognize that universities like ours have a role in fostering economic growth and prosperity for all Canadians. Uh, our incubators and accelerators are making a difference. As mentioned by John, in just, few year, in just a few years, we launched 10 campus-based incubators which we uh, call uh, learning zones or innovation zones and in different fields uh, such as law, passion, energy, biomedical technologies and design. Our digital media zone is recognized as the top university-based incubator in the world. Now we bring that internationally recognized success uh, to a city that is, as I said, dear to my heart. Incubators are for um, the youth, for students, of course, but they are also for entrepreneurs of the surrounding city and region. And we want Brampton to be a hub, uh, attracting, a magnet to attract entrepreneurs uh, to the city of Brampton. We want to see entrepreneurs in this area explore their ideas right here in downtown Brampton and bring jobs and economic growth to the region. And the Ryerson Venture Zone in Brampton will nurture, nurture local entrepreneurs. It will help drive the uh, regional economy and create solutions that impact businesses and people. And of course, we bring to uh, this new zone our deep commitment to diversity and inclusion. What are, there is no better place than Brampton to celebrate the importance of diversity and inclusion. So my thanks to uh, Premier Davis for making that call more than five years ago. And of course, big thank you to uh, uh, both the men and the minister for their great partnership. And of course, anybody who contributed from day one, uh, big thank you for making this day possible. I cannot wait to see uh, what the future brings. And uh, a message to uh, our friend, uh, Mayor Brown, uh, in French we say, jamais deux sans trois, never two without three. Uh, last year, we celebrated the uh, uh, Rogers Cyber Secure Catalyst. Today, we are celebrating the Ryerson Venture Zone. I hope next year we'll uh, celebrate a bigger initiative that we can, without, with that, we can challenge 
the status quo and status quo and bring more opportunities to Brampton. Thank you very much, Farah, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, President Lachemi. Um, speaking to someone you know who's been supportive of local technology, I've covered the zones in the past on the news, so it is very exciting to hear about uh, your leadership and uh, experience in Ryerson and what Ryerson is about to bring uh, to Peel Region. And I'll start with Premier Davis. There we go. Um, one learning that has come in the last 10 years of Ryerson's zones is the importance of establishing an open and engaging community. Entrepreneurs, especially in early stages, uh, thrive in an environment where they can share, they can support, they can collaborate uh, and really inspire. So the Ryerson Venture Zone in Brampton hopes to achieve all of this uh, by listening to the local innovation community. And this is one of the themes we're gonna be discussing on the panel today. I know uh, uh, Mayor Brown introduced our guests uh, uh, briefly, but I want to give you a bit of a more in-depth uh, introduction on our panelists, our local entrepreneurs you're going to hear about. Bailey Parnell is the founder and CEO of Soft Skills Company, Skills Camp, and named uh, one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women. Sobi Walia is the co-founder and uh, operations direct director of Cloop uh, and has led the adoption of his artificial intelligence platform, by companies like Starbucks, McDonald's, Red Bull, Amazon, Lyft, Nike, L'Oreal, Microsoft. Uh, Randy Osei is the CEO of Rose Management, uh, a Brampton native, a former basketball player that now works with over 150 professional athletes from the NBA, NFL, CFL, and MLS. And Nathaniel Bagnell is the co-founder of Live Gage and is responsible for the overall business strategy and direction of this fast-growing analytics firm that was founded in Brampton, Ontario. Returning as moderator of this panel is John McRitchie, who is the AVP of the Zone Learning and Strategic uh, Initiatives at Ryerson University. John, take it away. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Farah. Uh, and thanks again to the uh, panelists for, for joining us this morning. Uh, just for the, those that are online with us there, we won't actually have a chance to uh, do Q&A in this session. However, we've set aside and the panelists have all graciously agreed to stay on uh, at, from about 9.30 till 10 o'clock uh, to do some uh, questions and answers and, and discussion. If, if you're able to join us for that, we'd, we'd be happy to have you there. What uh, you can do during this session, if you do have questions, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of, of your screen on the Zoom screen, and you can submit your questions there. You can also take a look at questions that have been submitted and upvote them. If you see ones that you'd like to see asked of the panel, uh, you can uh, indicate that, that that's one you'd like to, to see asked. And in the session between 9.30 and 10, we can, uh, we can um, put those questions forward to the panel and kind of continue that discussion uh, at that point. So uh, let's go ahead. We, we've mentioned a couple of times that the role uh, community plays in, in supporting an entrepreneur's journey. Um, the, uh, what we'd like to be able to do uh, as we build the zone is, is help to build the, the, the connections to the community, to advisors, customers, investors, uh, and sometimes others that are, are important to that journey. And so one of the questions I think I'd like to start off with to, to the panelists uh, is whether just maybe a story to talk about the connections that have helped uh, support your journey and how that, uh, you know, how that's influenced you at some point. Maybe there's, there's a highlight or, or some experience that you see that, that can, you, you could speak to there. Um, perhaps uh, I'll start off with Nate, if, if you could uh, maybe talk to that question. No, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I think community connection and community is beyond important, both for like the business development, but also your personal progression. Uh, if you think about it, it's like a fundamental time for someone to, to really take on their dreams. And I think that we get this painting in our heads from movies that you know, you're just sitting in your room and you're disconnected from everybody. And then boom, you have like this whole team around you and everything is humming. But there's so much social aspect to being an entrepreneur and to having that connection that really can't be ignored. I mean, when you start, I think the even when you're in physical, even when you're in a physical presence of other entrepreneurs that you'll be um, experiencing soon, post COVID, <laughs> with the Ryerson Venture Zone, I think that 
Um, one of the big things is you have to be proactively immersive into the community because when you're sitting there, I mean, everybody's in their own lanes. So if you don't reach out to people, if you don't say hi to somebody, um, that level of connection will be just surface level uh, and you won't really get much value of it. Uh, and being here, I think we're really exceptionally fortunate to be here in Brampton um, because there's an am amazing amount of regional, provincial, and federal support um, for your entrepreneurial endeavors. And John, like you asked, I'll sort of go into some examples of what LiveGage has had. Um, so we benefited a lot from these programs, mentor access, um, the overall community quite immensely from financial perspectives, operational, and even international growth. <clears throat> so even with Ryerson and the DMZ, that's really where we all started. Um, and it was from there, I would say it's almost like our guidebook where we got connected to all these things around us OCE, we met our OCE rep, for those that aren't familiar with that, it's a great sort of um, a provincial organization that helps connect entrepreneurs with funding opportunities. Uh, NSERC and IRAP, which is another government, federal, um, insta, federal initiative that helps entrepreneurs get connected to things for research and innovation grants and other types of support. Mentorship, we got connected to, to the DMZ. When we were first starting off, we really had no idea for the fundamentals like bookkeeping, legal advice, things like that. So when I say guidebook, the DMZ was like that and sort of saying like, hey, here are all the things that you have access to. Um, and again, to my point, but you have to go and talk to them. You have to go and reach out. You have to go engage. Um, even uh, locally, I was just got notified um, that the Rick Center that we used to go into, it was in Mississauga, it's being moved to Brampton and how what a perfect fundamental time that is. That is where we actually got in connection with um, what's called sort of the, the trade ministers, which if anybody can believe it, there are people who are hired by the government to take all this great Canadian innovation and showcase it around the world. You will be able to be connected to potential markets, not only just in the United States, but around the world in Europe, Asia, and things like that. And all of these programs, again, is from this community no, like we literally had no idea these existed prior to being connected to the DMZ and the whole entrepreneurial sort of ecosystem that exists with us. Uh, and again, it's, it's not like you're going to be given, um, you sit down and you're, you're not going to be given this sort of roadmap. It's going to be a, a smorgasbord of opportunities here placed in front of you, but you have to take that initiative to talk to people and get that organized that best suits your business. Um, but fortunate thing is, I think we're all very uh, collaborative and very open. So when you go and want to sit down with that conversation, you're going to be able to have it and it's going to be very beneficial. Great, thanks. Uh, Randy, what's any thoughts from your side or what's what's been your experience? Oh, uh, one, I'd like to uh, say hello to everyone. I hope everyone's having a, a great Wednesday. Um, you know, my experience has been a little bit different. Uh, I am from Brampton. I ended up leaving Brampton in, in 2012 to move to the States. Um, and came back in 2018 wanting to really focus on uh, helping entrepreneurs like myself and uh, navigating different ways to really just grow entrepreneurship on multiple levels. And uh, uh, moving back to Canada, essentially, and then you know, moving back to Brampton, I took a peak interest in looking at what resources were available. Um, as Nathaniel alluded to, there are a lot of resources and um, you have to, you know, take those steps towards those resources uh, to activate them, right? They say you, you can lead a, a horse to water, but you can't make it drink it. Um, and, you know, my experience has, has been uh, an amazing, you know, the past two years have been simply amazing from connecting with, you know, Daniel Bishan and, and Prince Khan and um, the launch of the Brampton Entrepreneurship Center, where I, I would go there and, you know, just be able to connect with like-minded people that are thinking of different ways to solve problems. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, you have a vision that no one can see the way that you do. Uh, you also wear multiple hats, right? You're, you're the head of sales, you're the head of marketing, you're the head of brand, you're the head of corporate social responsibility, you're the head of so many different things. And that's, that's the thing that makes entrepreneur, uh, being an entrepreneur exciting and scary at the same time because you know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. So the things that you don't know 
find ways to, you know, connect with mentors and advisors and, and people that have done it before you and allow them to help you um, get to your vision. Uh, uh, within Brampton, you know, the, uh, the Brampton Entrepreneurship Center was, 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 was great, um, has been great and continues to be great. Um, I, I, like I said, I still talk to Daniel often. Um, uh, the Peel Rick Center is moving, like Nathaniel just uh, mentioned, and I'm actually joining the Peel Rick Center. We, I've worked with the Peel Rick Center before with uh, one of my other ventures. Um, the, the Brampton YMCA has been great. Brampton Board of Trade. Uh, I became a member last year and being invited to the events and, and really just learning that there's so many different businesses here. Cannon, Rogers, uh, Maple Leaf Farms, just large corporations that do business here that if you're not really paying attention or if you're not looking for these things, you won't see these things. So, you know, I've been able to pick up new clients, uh, pick up new mentors, uh, advisors to help me, you know, figure things out. And uh, to kind of give you an example um, in, in building, you know, one of, one of my favorite projects, uh, the Athlete Technology Summit, connecting professional athletes to uh, tech innovation here in Canada. Um, uh, the city of Brampton was, was monumental in helping me connect with uh, different brands and, and different corporations. Uh, Bailey Parnell, who's from Brampton, um, connected me with the, uh, who's now the chief technical officer of Toronto uh, in Lawrence Atta. And you don't get to do those things unless you build relationships, right? Um, and, you know, your social equity is, is what's going to help you grow and, and become and get closer to that vision because, that vision only you can see it the way you see it. And it's, it's important that you, you share bits and pieces with people to allow people to uh, come along your journey with you. You know, as an entrepreneur, I'm, I'm still growing and I'm still going. And, you know, the Athlete Tech Summit, which was an event, has now turned into the Athlete Tech Group, which is an event in, in, in media company. And uh, we're really working towards building uh, the next generation of entrepreneurs. So I think, you know, the Ryerson Venture Zone will be, uh, monumental in helping um, Brampton entrepreneurs grow. And the last piece I wanted to talk about is the amount of amazing talent that comes from Brampton. Not only everyone that's sitting on this panel, but when we look at people that, you know, we listen to and people that we watch on TV, a lot of them come from Brampton. So, you know, if you're, if you're a Bramptonian or, you know, you just moved to the city, there's a lot to be proud of when it comes to Brampton, you know, from, you know, lottery NBA picks to, uh, music artists on billboard charts like they walk the same streets as you and you know they had to um, figure out what made sense for them and find their resources um, but the city's making and bringing those resources to your front door you just have to go and um, activate them really you're on mute john you're Sorry about that. Um, no, you're okay. <laughs> six months and you still make that mistake. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Randy. Those are good, really good points. And it, it's so true that there are, as, as both of you pointed out, there, there are, often there's lots of great resources and people there. It's, it's sometimes making that first step to reach out and, and make, those, make those first contacts that, that, that get you started. Um, Sobi, can you maybe talk to some of your experience with this? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. My name is Sobi Walia. Uh, I'm the co-founder and operations director here at Coop, which is an artificial intelligent mobile app platform that can target people based on what they're sharing, how they're feeling, and where they go in the physical world. Now to answer uh, John's question um, regarding the connections to entrepreneurs, mentors, and advisors, I actually can't stress how important it is to bring advisors and mentors on board as, as early as possible in your journey, actually. Being able to tap into their networks uh, can help you get your first paying uh, customer or even help you uh, find product, product market fit. Um, that's exactly what happened to us. Our first client ran a campaign uh, back in 2014 in the summer. I remember it was for the 20th Century Fox for a movie called The Fault in Our Stars. Uh, we, could, we couldn't have landed that client if our first angel investor hadn't made a warm introduction that time. Um, we went after advisors in the marketing and advertising industry via LinkedIn, Mars, and networking events. 
showed them a live demo of our live working product and got them excited about, about, about our software and the underlying machine learning algorithms which we developed over the past uh, three years uh, back in 2011. Um, and uh, another key thing which we did was uh, we also gave uh, stock options uh, in our company for return of introductions for paying customers. So those are some of the, the tactics and some of the things we did on bringing on boards these mentors and advisors early on, which helped us uh, through our journey on, on, on bringing on board some of the major brands and which we're working on. Yeah. That's great, thanks, Sophie. And finally, I turn to Bailey, maybe if you could talk to some of your journey, so. Yeah, for sure. First off, I just want to say I'm so glad to be here with you all and good for you for showing up at 8 a.m. on Wednesday morning because let me tell you as an entrepreneur, that is step one, showing up. So I, uh, and also I'm so glad to be here because it's literally almost the Venn diagram of my personalities and identities. I actually am a grad of Ryerson two times over, both my undergrad in RTA media production and my master's in communications and culture and I grew up in Brampton, and I've worked with the city of Brampton. So this is all coming together um, into entrepreneurship in Brampton, which is just perfect for me. So I'm happy to be here and I'm glad you are here as well. So for me, a little bit about me was that growing up, my, I have a big family, three sisters, two stepsisters, four parents, and uh, my parents, my mom and my dad didn't finish high school. So I was also, and there was no traditional entrepreneurs in the family. So even as I went into university, first in the family, and I started to be surrounded by the mentality at Ryerson at the time, which was very much innovation and entrepreneurship led, and the zones were all popping up. And um, this was kind of, kind of inseminating itself into the student's mind, I think. Um, even after leading, having a record of leading projects, big projects, um, entrepreneurship, if you will, I still, I even sold shows and I still didn't see myself as an entrepreneur. So even after all of that, I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur. So where the mentors and the advisors came in, they were absolutely critical in my journey, um, not only for actually helping with things like biz dev, biz design, and how to make money, but also mindset, I think, was a big thing for me because I never grew up saying I want to be an entrepreneur. And there was really no stories like that around me uh, in my space. So a, a few stories I wanted to share with you that were almost like I couldn't write them better for this, uh, you know, off of what Nathaniel said at the beginning, sometimes you just have to go say hi. What I found in my career is that if it's hard for some of you to do that, it's less hard for me, but I own a soft skills training company. So I'm maybe a bit biased, but it's hard for a lot of my students to just go up and say hi. And so what I like to recommend to other entrepreneurs is to put yourself in situations where those connections are facilitated for you. And that's why, again, I couldn't write this better. I did city programs. I did um, the city of Toronto starter company program. And that's because I was just living in Toronto right after I graduated school. 10 week program, how to start a business, five grand at the end. And the best part was access to a mentor community. The mentor I chose and who accepted me, if you will, was uh, Richard Lee, who was a former partner of Deloitte. He's still a mentor in my business. And he, gave, and he was also in my first testimonials video for Skills Camp. Um, another, so facilitated by the city of Toronto. For, um, for all my entrepreneurs here who are women identified, I'm also part of two other groups. One is CEO as an activator, where literally the first coffee I had was with the former CEO of Amex Canada. I just reached out because it was facilitated by CEO. I'm also part of WXN, as you heard, or the Women's Executive Network. And I'm not joking, when we took our photo for winning the award, I was standing beside the VP of Human Resources at CIBC. I made some joke in the line and she laughed and we went for coffee. <laughs> and so when we went for coffee, she, we, we continued to go for coffee and, um, you know, in real life, in-person coffee, if you can believe it. And she, um, I offered, I tried to offer things that even though I wanted CIBC as a client or I wanted to know how Skills Camp could land early on a client like CIBC, she, 
I also tried to see how I could provide her value. And so then um, the other side of me, it just further down in the WXN Awards was also the head of um, Bank of Canada. So also made a connection with her through WXN and CIBC and Bank of Canada became a couple of Skills Camp's first Hallmark clients. And then the best story for last for you, because I also couldn't write this better, in my fourth year undergrad at Ryerson, I won a scholarship called the Delvinia Digital Innovation and Entrepreneurship Scholarship, which came with a mentorship opportunity with the CEO of that company if you wanted it. Um, he also tried to hire me, but I declined to know he's a mentor in the company. <laughs> But what he did was he, um, I did go for that mentorship, now facilitated by Ryerson, that connection. And uh, he actually helped me a lot with, uh, with mindset. So, and getting over that fear of failure and leaving the full-time job to go full-time with Skills Camp. And so beyond just connections to business, uh, you, know, you know, Randy that you just heard from is a, is a good friend now and, and we're trying to help each other win all the time. Um, there's also that like mentors can help with that mindset. I think that's what Nathaniel was saying, which is like you put yourself in these situations where people think and act a certain way and you start to kind of ingest that if it also wasn't around you as a kid. So critical, um, if it's not natural for you to reach out and say hi, this is the absolute perfect opportunity because Ryerson's coming together, the city of Brampton to say, hey, we're gonna facilitate this for you. Thanks. Thanks, Bailey. That was great points. And I, th I think what you hit on that it's often these little steps that you can take and, and finding ways to make that, that first step easier is so important. Um, Cause there's, there's lots of people out there who like yourself don't necessarily come from a family of entrepreneurs. I mean, sometimes you hear the story of somebody, Oh yeah, my dad was my granddad or my uncle, but what do you do if you don't have that? that background and, and or that that connection so um, so it can be intimidating and figuring out those little steps that you can take or ways that that just make that easier to get going and it is just sometimes just start with the little steps and and you'll get the, you it, it begins to get you going on that that journey that you need to take along the next sort of question I had is is related um, the what I am interested in in understanding we're coming into Brampton with this zone you all have strong connections in Brampton um, either from there or you've done things there or you had experience trying to get things going there what what are the things that are sort of unique about Brampton from your experience that that we should be leveraging and what what's in a sense what's your advice for for us if we're going to be setting up this zone and and, and how do we get uh, what what sort of things can we do that, that we we should be doing there that you think can make the most difference and leverage what there is good in, in Brampton. Um, and just before I, I turn it over to you, just as a reminder to everybody that's online with us, um, throw some questions at, at, at this group. These, these people have, have great experience and um, ideas and uh, use the Q&A at the bottom and we can, we'll take those questions on and, and be able to, to uh, have a bit of a discussion at, at 9.30 if you can stay on with us for a little bit longer. So, uh, but Bailey, if I'll, I'll turn back to you first this time, just what's your advice to us? What, what sort of things can we, should we do to leverage Brampton in the best way possible? Yeah, so I think that it's already been mentioned in some of the intros, but what I find with Brampton and what I'm so grateful for having grown up there is that it's just incredibly rich in diversity of everything, really, like diversity of story, of people, of food, and even of, of kinds of businesses that are hiding over there. And, um, <clears throat> and so I think what what I'm actively working towards and why I'm also really glad to be here with y'all is that I think we should be leveraging more pride of Brampton and growing more pride of Brampton. And, um, you know, like when I, my fiance is also a successful entrepreneur, except he's from Scarborough. So we have a healthy you know, East West rivalry, but mostly what we're both trying to do is, is just rep our city. Like when I go abroad or when I'm in Toronto, I'm not saying I'm from Toronto. No, I'm not saying I'm from the GTA. I'm saying I'm from Brampton get it right. And I'm doing that on purpose because I don't want the kids who want to be entrepreneurs today to have to go out and say they're from the GTA because they don't want to say Brampton. That really bothers me. And so I'm actively working to change that. And, um, and, and I know the folks are here too, to say, 
I'm from Brampton and I actually have a list in my phone. It's so funny you're saying, Randy, about who you listen to and who you watch. I just made a list because I was tired of people testing me about all these famous people from Brampton. And the list is very long and I, we have not been able to make a list as long for any other city in Canada. So I keep that list, also the entrepreneurship. And then I'll say like, on any marker of a good city like what do you mark a good city on infrastructure support of business parks like what do you mark a good city on brampton meets every single marker on that so i'm proud to be from there and um and then in that pride that also means supporting people who are coming up and who are coming behind you or up with you in any way that i can so you know randy and i have already talked about like helping each other win but if i'm being completely transparent i am more willing to work with someone if they say they are from Brampton <laughs> and I'm much more willing to take a coffee and I will fall, like I will stand behind that and I'll share my email um, if I can help in any way and uh, and in that trying to help each other win I find like like for example my first Forbes feature was from Pollyanna Reed, who is a Forbes writer and business owner of a mentorship company and of a ghostwriting company. And because that being from Brampton is what connected us. And so it's really like that story that, um, that I think we should tell more and lean into. And then when you're trying to help each other win, it's not, doesn't have to be a zero sum game. Theoretically, there is, you know, a client that could go to her mentorship company or hire skills camp for their business. And guess what? We don't care. There's enough for all of us. I'm going to send her clients. She's going to send me clients. She's going to send me um, possible, like, uh, what am I saying? Opportunities that she thinks would be good for me. In fact, my web designer and developer is from Brampton and he's the one that recommended me for this. So it all goes around. Anyways, I'll probably talk forever on that. But basically, I think like if we want to leverage the strengths and the diversity of Brampton, we have to be willing to proudly say that we're from Brampton and then back it up by actually supporting other people who are too. You're on mute, John. So that, no, that's great advice, Bailey. And I think we did, we, um, I think that's one of the, the key goals that, that we have too, is, is really just, and we've seen that with, with the zones that we do have is is providing a, a place whether it's even virtual or in person that you can showcase what the good stuff that's going on um, it works both externally and it works uh, internally in the community because if people see that success that others have had they can start to say well maybe i can do that too and they get started on, on, on going yeah like maybe i can do it and i don't have to leave brampton to do it like that's, that's right. the big part that i love yeah. Yeah. Well, we're already hearing from me, from each of you. There's, there's been, there's a lot of, of resources, a lot of great people that, that are right there, right there in the city that people can tap into. And the closer you can make it, the easier it is for you to get started. So, so if I, um, if I could turn over to Sobi this time, uh, what's, what's your advice to us? What, what can we do um, that would, mm, would help? If I, if, if I could rewind as an entrepreneur and go back to when I was building Clue back in 2013, I wish I wish that I was able to network and tap into advisory services from corporate leaders and some senior execs in the marketing and advertising space. So I think it'd be great if there's a way to pair entrepreneurs and successful execs in similar industries. Another thing uh, which I wanted to mention here was like, we can also look at organizing hackathons because that's where me, my older brother, Karen Walia, and our other partner, Anton Madmanov, met back in 2011 at a hackathon, at a pitch contest. And then also having panel talks from successful entrepreneurs and also free coding boot camps, which could also be effective. So those are some of my recommendations. Good, thanks, Sobi. Um... I think with a lot of the experience that we've had uh, with the other zones and what we intend to do there is, is lining up some of that ex um, those other mentors and, and getting them in place, other and, and executives and people there within the community. That as well, I know with our experience that people talk a lot about attracting investors, but another key area that we need to do is, is to line up uh, the, the customers and, and find out the organizations that, that might be those first customers for for the entrepreneur, for the ventures that are getting started, um, even just so they can have that conversation to see if they they are solving a problem that somebody's willing to um, pay for a solution for. So, um, Randy, if I could turn over to you, sort of, what, what's your advice to us? What 
what should we in the zone there be doing? How can we do something maybe a little different than? Uh, I believe in the, the theory of proximity. Uh, those closest to the problem have normally have the answer. Um, so I think, especially for, for Ryerson and Ryerson Venture Zone, is paying attention to the entrepreneurship community, right? I mean, we've, we've I guess, all of us on this panel have somewhat figured it out and are still figuring it out. Um, so our needs are going to be a lot different than someone that's just starting up, right? Um, um, so really paying attention to your audience and engaging with your audience, you know, um, uh, understanding and getting buy-in early from community stakeholders. Um, so, you know, the, the Canons of the world, uh, the, the Rogers of the world, and allowing for like work integrated learning experiences. Cause it's, a, it's, it's great to be sent an email with some information and you read and I'll click to a link, but you know, people always remember how they feel. Right. It's, it's, it's not enough to just uh, receive information and take the information and all right, cool. I learned something, but I don't know how to use it or I don't know what setting would be the right time to pull out this skill or this knowledge piece that I've just uh, grown on. Um, and I think also making, I feel, you know, as, as a city, as great as, you know, the city is and the talent and, and the resources, um, I didn't really know about the resources until like I went looking for them, right? So really pushing, you know, these initiatives and getting to where your audience is. So, you know, Ryerson Venture Zone may have to create a TikTok because that's where your audience is. <laughs> you may have to create a Snapchat and engage with, you know, our entrepreneurs there, engage with our entrepreneurs on Instagram, engage with our entrepreneurs, you know, at their school dances and, and things like that, because you're not going to know where to get help, um, especially when you don't know where to look. And, you know, with, you know my experience um, over the last two years, I, I looked at, at business from many different levels. I obviously looked at it from a small business level, but, you know, being able to connect with MP leader uh, Ruby Sahoda has been huge for me, right? It's helped me to understand my business and being a black leader and what does diversity and inclusion look like from uh, a member of parliament uh, angle, you know, connecting with city councilor uh, Gurpreet Dillon. Uh, he's been someone that I've, I've gone to to ask for advice and, and learn and see what the city's doing from an entrepreneurship level and finding ways that I can really have an impact. Like Brampton is the first city to ever give me a, a grant, right? I also have a nonprofit. Brampton is the first city to ever give me a grant. And this year that grant doubled because Brampton believed in me, you know, um, Brampton gave me a chance. So um, my advice would be to really just connect with your audience and ensure that your audience knows that you exist, be a resource hub for the audience, um, a lot of free events, webinars, and use the talent that has come from Brampton, you know, the, the Baileys of the world, the, the Sobeys, the Nathaniels, the the Randys, the Akeem Gardners, the, you know, the little dribblers, all of these small businesses that come from Brampton that are doing great things, use them. Like have everyone use it as their, their, their pay it forward, right? Um, and I know Sobe talked about advisors. Um, we all have advisors, but we all have something that we could give and be advisors to, right? So if there's a, an advisor network or a, a mentorship group that, connects regularly to to answer some of these questions as as people are growing their visions and ideas will really go a long way and you know within within an ecosystem that's that's being built the the main thing is connectivity how many times do you connect how often do you connect and where do you connect and in really paying attention to those three things will really help Brampton and you know Ryerson Venture Zone you know allow Brampton to be as great as it as it can be and uh uh, continue to put Brampton on the map, man. This is a this is a city that a lot of us need to be very, very proud of. Very, 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 very proud of. Um, a lot has come from here, and I'm not going to be surprised to see a lot more come from Brampton as well. So I'm excited to see where where where, where this goes and um, how I can help uh, other entrepreneurs, you know, go through things that I don't I went through and how how difficult it is. Like. Being able, like I had a company, I launched a company in 2015. I didn't do my taxes to 2019. <laughs> I, 
and when it was time and thank god i did it because you know covid came and you know they were asking for all of this information but i had never done it i never thought it was important like i made money and i paid tax but it's a journey right and um how we get access to information and how we learn things is, is all different so just you know trying to be granular in how we operate and um, provide access to people is going to be huge yeah. well, I, uh, randy i think those are great points especially the one about being connected finding the entrepreneurs and understanding uh, and listening listening to them I, I think that that's been a fundamental thing i mean whether we learned it or figured it out early with with the zones it's always been a matter of sort of when you get started don't make too many assumptions about what's out there you, you have to do you have to stir the pot in some way i mean and, and figure out where the entrepreneurs are and then you you, you go to them and, and, and listen because they, 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 what we've seen is that they're there in every community it's then just a matter of finding them listening and figuring out what we need to do to to grow and and, and make that their journey more successful or a bit easier so 100 um, so, so uh, nate i'll turn over to you for you for your comments and what, what what's your advice to us no, for sure. Um, I think, uh, uh, as Randy pointed out, um, there's so much talent in Brampton, right? Um, and as much as we want to focus on bringing like the right assets, the mentors, and external resources to Brampton, I think we should also really start to to try to look at ways to get that amazing talent that, as Randy said, is walking on the same street with us, um, and bring that into the community. Um, because the community itself is very valuable, right? Uh, and then also echoing sort of Bailey and Randy's point on representing Brampton and encouraging that community that we're building to sort of showcase that Brampton pride. It does create like a return on investment in that sort of showcasing because eventually it's going to be that sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The more people see amazing talent from Brampton, the more they see this innovation, that internal dialogue inside themselves will be like, oh, Brampton, okay, like I want to go check that out. And that's a huge important piece. I have a few friends, I've known them for about half a decade or so now. Um, they do like podcasts, YouTube, things like that. And they've always represented Brampton uh, in their video. They'll always include a little thing at the starter end uh, in Brampton. It's like, it's a great little stamp that I love to always see, right? And I want everybody to do the same. Um, going, I guess, focusing on what the, the staff and the sort of zone can do. I think that private support um, what I remember with the Ryerson DMZ, because we were affiliated with that organization, we were able to unlock a lot of private support from Google and Amazon, um, valuable credits really for infrastructure, SaaS, um, things like that, which again, when you're starting off, every dollar counts and you might not be able to get that, uh, you know, the cash dollar, but to get that sort of in-kind value on the services that you're going to spend money on anyway, that's really important. Um, so trying to get that type of alignment with private partnership is important. I remember too, with um, Ryerson DMZ, our tours, that was a fantastic component of that model. And it would be great to have that brought into the venture zone where you're going to be able to sort of meet and get sit down face to face with potential customers, investors, and just other private organizations um, through that sort of tour model. And also what was really cool, sort of a, I think a secondary value that we, that we found of it is that some tours were private, um, but then some tours were um, sort of groups of companies sitting down together. And when we were in those group sessions, I would be able to observe and see how people pitched, um, how people sort of like answered questions. And that was a, a, a prime example of learning from the community. Like how did other entrepreneurs deal with these questions? The same ones that I was dealing with, right? Um, as Sobi and Randy pointed out, mentorships with sort of for, uh, focused help on uh, core disciplines. Uh, I, I really like that, that saying that Randy said, like, you know, those who are most closest to the problem that you're dealing with probably has the answer. And, you know, and as uh, Sobi pointed out, like, hey, having more close connection with marketing executives and things like that um, would have been really helpful for him. So I think as the Venture Zone on boards as entrepreneurs and crafts its community, uh, I would say that keeping a pulse on what types of companies they're bringing in and how, what, are, what resources they could align themselves with would be really important. 
Uh, I mean, in essence, like, you know, I go back to my experience and I kept on citing Ryerson DMZ, that whole administrative team there, they executed the community and the resources fundamentally well. And I think that it's uh, a pretty big blessing to have Ryerson and the DMZ sort of experience and executional expertise come through to the Ryerson Metro Zone here in Brampton. I genuinely believe that there's probably no other uh, organization better suited to launch something like this. So, yeah, it's exciting. Thanks. Thanks, Nate. I appreciate the compliments there. Uh, it's, it's great to hear. And I think the, the points that you made, particularly around um, sort of facilitating that, that peer-to-peer -peer interaction that you get in the environment, I mean, that, that's one of the key reasons why we build, uh, why, why these things are built, whether it's us or other groups. You, you put an incubator or an innovation a hub together to one of the key advantages you have in doing that is is that is that peer-to-peer -peer interaction that that happens between the entrepreneurs that are there and I know when we when, when we were when we looked at teams coming into the DMZ or into the other zones one of the key questions that we're always asking ourselves is not just what uh, will that team get out of their participation there are they really you know, like is this a high potential for success, but also asking is, is this a team that's going to be willing to contribute back? Are they going to be open? Are they going to be, be good community members and, and also contribute to, to that experience? Um, just the, the last thing I, I, I'd close off before I turn back to, to Farah is uh, just the, the points you, you, you started off making around, around talent. And I think you, you each touched on that there, uh, Bailey's highlighted the importance of soft skills. It's one of the key things that we've seen with the experience, especially for younger entrepreneurs. Um, starting a venture is, is tough. They don't always succeed, but the experience that somebody gets in doing this and all the things that they learn and having to, to get a venture going and, and the interactions that they have to have build up an incredible amount of skills um, that, that, are, that are really useful. I, I, remember sitting with with some other with uh, reps from some companies in in brampton at one point um all from you know fairly technical companies really their key thing though was looking for talent that had the, the right soft skills the technical question was was kind of a given um but it's these skills that you're that, that somebody going through a, an experience like this uh will get are going to do them um really lay a great foundation for their for their career whether it's as an entrepreneur or or other ways that can contribute uh, to organizations in the community as well I, i'll thank you each very much for your your comments uh, this morning here um, as i mentioned we'll be sticking around at 9 30 if anybody in the audience has some questions for the panelists we'll be back there to to maybe do a little bit of q a and, and some discussion at that point so again thank you all very much for your great comments and thanks for for the great things that you're saying about brampton and 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 the potential that that's here it's wonderful to hear thank you Farah. thanks john wow what an engaging energizing discussion uh so much great insight and, and perspectives and and you know randy i was just thinking about something that you said about the talent in brampton even beyond the innovation community from uh, alessia cara to michael sarah to russell peters to rupi core to director x i could go on there is something definitely in the water in Brampton <laughs> that's making this happen. So uh, that part of it is very exciting and a lot to be proud of uh, from the city of Brampton. Um, now the good news, as John mentioned, is that this conversation is going to keep going after uh, this main event. So stick around um, from 9.30 to 10 uh, when our panelists are going to answer uh, questions from you, the audience. I see that there are already some questions in there. Quite a few, actually. Uh, so, and if you if you have a question in, on your mind right now, you can submit it uh, using the Q and A function uh, below here on Zoom. Uh, an emerging vision for the Ryerson Venture uh, Zone in Brampton is to really serve as a model for economic, um, as a, sorry, as a model economic growth engine, and uh, to really develop, as we've talked about quite a bit, um, entrepreneurial talent uh, locally. So, so to speak more about the zone and how it can really contribute to this talent pipeline is Sayed Zulfagari. He is the provost and vice president, academic Ryerson University. Provost, over to you. Thank you, Farah, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today, and I hope that you've enjoyed the event so far as much as I did. Excellent panelists and great panel discussion. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and this is what Ryerson Venture Zone is about, and I'm very excited by the potential of this Venture Zone. This initiative is a wonderful collaboration with the city of Brampton 
and the local community. I'm honored and very pleased to see that Ryerson can contribute to entrepreneurship and innovation in Brampton. The presence of Ryerson Venture Zone in Brampton uh, will serve as a model for regional economic growth, as Farah said. Uh, it will build a future talent pipeline in the city. And as you know, community and city building are a priority for Ryerson University. Uh, that is reflected in our academic plan and is reflected in the Ryerson Venture Zone. In leading the, this development, uh, Ryerson also brings access to other resources and expertise of the university, uh, including upskilling opportunities in affiliation with Ryerson, uh, Ryerson Chang School of Continuing Education, uh, collaborative uh, research opportunities with Ryerson researchers, and of course, access to talent through internship co-ops and graduates. Uh, we look forward to working with other members of the innovation ecosystem in Brampton. Our goal is to build on the resources available to local entrepreneurs to accelerate their successful journey. Uh, the call for applications to the community health and wellness challenge will be a great opportunity to work together. It will also lay the foundation for additional programs that support Brampton entrepreneurs and support the innovation system in the community. Thank you again, and I wish you all the best of success. But right, I over to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Provost, for that and for those words. Uh, you know, the residents and communities uh, of Brampton and Peel Region really look forward, of course, to benefiting from the continued partnership uh, between Ryerson and the city of Brampton. So uh, I am going to close now. I want to thank you all uh, and thank our speakers, uh, Mayor Brown, uh, Minister Sakaria, uh, President Lashemi, and uh, Provost Zulfa Gary, as well as our panelists who are still on, Bailey, uh, uh, Sobi, um, Randy, Nathaniel, and John. Um, and I just want to uh, all uh, thank all of you, all the attendees, for, for waking up uh, so bright and early, as, uh, as Bailey pointed out. I know some of you are entrepreneurs. Um, so thank you again for, for joining us on this historic day for this historic historic launch. Uh, I'm going to leave you now because I have to get ready for what I'm sure is going to be a very busy news day, uh, a very busy COVID-related news day, uh, but I'm going to turn it back over to John uh, for the rest of the discussion. Thanks so much for having me, and I wish you all a wonderful day and a wonderful rest of the week. Just to make sure I'm back, I'm back again. So uh, thanks everybody who stayed on and thanks uh, again for joining us. As, as we've said, uh, we'll, we'll make the, we've kind of concluded the formal session here uh, and we'll move on to some questions and, and answers with our, uh, with, the, um, with the panelists. I think just before I do that, I'm not even sure if it's possible or if she'd be willing to do it, but it, um, Farhan, is it possible to have uh, Usha on screen at all? Um, I, I did want to highlight uh, Usha Srinivasan, who's the director for the, the Brampton Venture Zone, has been um, been really working very tirelessly over the last couple of months, few months, uh, to to get this thing up and uh, up and going. Uh, and I did want to again just just mention that she'll be she'll be the main contact for the zone. Oh, there, great, there she is. Here. <laughs> um, we had um, there were a couple of things that that she asked me to stand in this morning just in case some uh, other issues had come up. That, uh, but um, but all, all is all is well, and she's she is with us this morning. And I did did want to uh, to highlight Usha because it's really been her work and and her team's work. Uh, uh, with Nadia and Yashin that that have pulled things things together uh, for for the launch, and they'll be uh, they'll be the, the the main your main contacts for the zone in the in the going forward as as we get we get going there. So, uh, thank you, John. And uh, we've been getting uh, lots of great questions uh, in the uh, chat channel here, and so maybe we could tackle some of them and. Um, uh, these have been coming. So to the to, to the listeners, uh, to the participants, there are still hundred people still waiting. For, and so if you have more questions, please do send us, and we will do our best to get to the questions. Um, and so um, one of the ones that uh, we uh, we just got uh, was related to uh, investment opportunities, I believe. Um, 
So we had um, we have a couple of them come up. Um, what I can um, I think just looking at the list here. Uh, in fact, it was one of the ones I had had on my list as well. Uh, if I could just um, pass to each of the uh, the panelists, and, and Sobi, I see you on on the top left of my screen. So right now, so I'm going to go to you first, and just if there's uh, what is there one biggest lesson that you learned, or or perhaps similarly, is there single like what? If you had one piece of advice for somebody getting started, what would it be? There's a, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of challenges you face throughout the journey. And, uh, and you know, you know, entrepreneurship, uh, it, it requires a strong love for the work you're doing uh, and, and your hearts have to be in it. Uh, and you just have something unique. Based on based on if the businesses are willing to pay for it, I think then then you'll find ways to overcome things. Um, and 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 starting that new starting your new business and building your dream pretty much. But uh, but yeah, like my opinion would be just just to get started and and remove yourself from distractions and focus, just laser focus on things which really matter to you. Like things which really matter to me was prop, my product. It had to be very robust. We had to take our time before we shipped it and launched it. Um, the people we hired and sales. So just, just be laser focused on things which really matter to you uh, without any distractions and just start the journey, I would say. I think to, to add to Sobe's point, um, you know, I love watching Shark Tank. And one of the things that you see there, like everyone has a great business idea, right? Investors are investing. Yeah, they might like you. Yeah, they may like the vision, the idea, but they're here to make money. <laughs> so as much as a great idea or a great vision um, could go a long way, um, for entrepreneurs, f figure out your business, so the business side to your idea. So figure out how do you make money? How often do you make money? What is the market opportunity? How much of the market that you want to capture and how much money are you going to need to capture that percentage? That's what investors want to know, right? And if we're not focused on answering those questions, when we watch Shark, when I watch Shark Tank, some of the, some of the ideas that come up, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. But then you hear the business side and, you know, we haven't made any revenue. We have no key partners. We don't really understand our market. We just have an idea. It's hard for someone to buy into something. Because remember what I originally said, you have, an, you have a vision that only you can see the way that you see it. For an investor, they might buy into a vision and an idea, but the idea has to make business sense. There has to be market opportunity. There has to be market. There has to be a share 2% of the market. I want 2% of X, Y, and Z market because 2% of that market is going to turn into a $10 million a year business for us in three years. But we need $200,000 today to get there and resources and partnerships and advisory and so on and so forth. So I find a lot of entrepreneurs um, have great ideas, have great solutions but aren't taking the time to focus on building a business. You have to build a business and the world of business is a scary place. So, um, you know, oh. Brampton's Ryerson venture zone, you know, providing these resources to help you build your business. So you can then go and uh, receive investment is, is a strategy that I think really will help entrepreneurs and how they see their own journey. Yeah. To be fair, I didn't know any of that when I started Skills Camp. <laughs> like when I, uh, I certainly when I started Skills Camp, I, like I mentioned earlier in the chat, I didn't see myself as an entrepreneur. But then slowly over time, what happened was that um, it was I used to work in student affairs in a university, which is kind of everything outside the classroom that supports student success. And it was clear that students who use the services were more successful, but the reality was most weren't. There was a lot of research coming out at the time about the importance of soft skills. And now I don't even really have to do that much work anymore to convince people on the validity. But there was this problem that emerged. I thought I was actually just the best person to solve the problem because I had a very unique career history of media with marketing and sales and 
like broadcast presentation and public speaking. So like all put and then, you know, in terms of what we teach higher ed. So that first year is really, you know, I was saying this is what we teach, but I was kind of testing, uh, do, do we go B2B and work with businesses? Do we go B2C and invite people to come learn with us? What skills should we teach? And then after that, it was almost like in that year, uh, the market was revealing itself to us and making, and so that we could make the right decisions. But I say to your, to your question, John, um, to an earlier point I made about, about uh, that mentor from Ryerson that helped with mindset and going full time with the business. One of the things that they helped with was that fear of failure. And I had a, I'll never, a session with them. I, I'll never forget where I was like, okay, I want to go full time with the business, but I'm not sure I have enough money in the business bank to fund me and overhead for like at least a year is what I wanted. And I was like nervous because no one was around to no one basically no one was going to pay my bills there was no backup option if it didn't go well and he said so what will you do if you like what happens then and i was like well, worst case scenario is i can't pay rent and he's like and then what happens and i was like well like i'd have to move i guess back in with my dad in brampton and i, I was like but that is not an option <laughs> like you do not move back home once you've moved home out and then he's like, okay, wait, so you would have a place to sleep and you would have food and you're very employable and you could get a job. And I was like, oh, so after that, um, it made me realize it was myself getting in the way and that it was probably more like failing out loud. That was the issue at the time. And so you really, um, for all you listening, that was a big thing I had to overcome to actually just lean into this and, and just go give it 100%. And so sometimes it's yourself getting in the way and you need to have kind of a mindset shift. And then all these opportunities just suddenly appear and they were probably already there. Uh, thank you, Bailey, for sharing that. If you don't take those risks and you are not putting yourself in that scary place, you no risk, no reward kind of a situation. There was, um, so there was a, there's a question from the audience around um, investment. I know Randy mentioned earlier about, you know, think about your business first before you go and ask, get that business model done uh, really well before you go and raise that funding. But I think there are some specific questions around what has your experience been in terms of investment, family and friends round, or were you going to angels or where, or how did you approach that? So any, any, uh, any insights on that? Perhaps, Randy, you want to go first? Yeah, for sure. I think um, looking, understand, within understanding your business, you look at, you look at, you know, the, I think in investing, the big thing with investing is in and around storytelling. Like, how do you tell your story, right? Like, what is the opportunity and what story are you trying to tell and how is money going to help you tell that story? Um, you know, when you go to your friends and family, you, you have a vision, you have an idea and you have a story to tell. Like, Hey, I was, um, changing this and this turned into this business idea. And I think I could turn this into this. That's a story. Right. And it's the same thing in, 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 you know, chatting with investors, um, is selling them on this story, right. Selling them on this vision, selling them on this opportunity that hey if you get it now it's an opportunity for you to make money uh, so one is is being able to tell the right story so um, I know Mars and you know the Rick Center has uh, um, a, a deck strategy uh, template that I follow right we figure out what the problem is you know what the market opportunity is what's the solution where are the other opportunities who's on the team so on and so forth I also think, you know, paying attention to, you know, your local government, right? There's a lot of grants and um, opportunity to offset your own, you know, startup and bootstrapping costs yeah. by accessing these things that are available to entrepreneurs, right? So signing up for the Rick Center and sitting down and having a conversation and allowing them to map out what your journey could look like. There's the free route. <laughs> And there's the route that if you, if you have a little bit of money and you could spend and invest into your company that can help you get to where you need to get to. Yeah. Um, so it really is a lot of, there's a lot of free resources to just get you going. But I think if you're able to tell the right story financially 
um, give the right details of the vision, and then also tap into a lot of the free resources in and around you. Um, yes. It'll get you off the ground. And I think that's one of the biggest things is getting off the ground. Bailey just talked, she had no idea what she was doing. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I would like to say a lot of us had no idea of what we were doing when we first started. And often, um, often early stage entrepreneurs, like you said, uh, but without thinking through their business or uh, how, you know, how they're going to make the investors money, they, the, the first thing they think about is, you give me money and then I'll figure it out. You know, so they think money solves all problems no. <laughs> and, and don't understand the, the, uh, the, the investment they're uh, getting through um, uh, uh, VCs might be actually more sometimes uh, challenging to manage than uh, others. And in Canada, we have so much non-dilutive uh, financing that's available that entrepreneurs sometimes are not aware of. And um, that's something that you know, they need to, also keep in mind. Um, I can I can I can speak a little bit to that on, on on how to actually get started. I would say like to utilize some of the resources like LinkedIn. I, I say LinkedIn is is a great place to start to look for and reach out to potential advisors and investors. Um, like you you just gotta send those cold emails and 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 for potential meetings and and you should be prepared like Randy said to demonstrate some traction of the product you're building or at least a working minimum viable product. Uh, like for us, it took several meetings over a span of for five to six months to actually get a meeting set up while those cold emails we were sending, uh, just to convince an angel investor to invest and make introductions. Uh, like we stayed persistent and regularly communicated the updates we were working on um, of product development, traction and momentum. So yeah, I would just say it does take time. Uh, even, even if you have a great product, you just have to, you can't give up after your first or two emails. Yeah, I, I have a question related to that I'm gonna come back to, but Nate, uh, I'd love your feedback on how uh, you've approached investment uh, with LiveGage. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and actually, before we move on to that, into that, I just want to say one thing. So from the previous question, like one lesson, one lesson I just want to say, um, I felt it was really, really cool was um, everybody says pivot to, you know, like, oh, pivot the product, pivot the product. There was just one time, and this was like the one lesson from the previous question. Um, I was in a meeting and I was pitching the customer and I was sort of showcasing the dashboard. And the, the, the fundamental metrics of what our product provided to the customer was valuable. But the problem was the labels were in a discussion that uh, were like, so we were originally going retail, then we went into sort of the marketing world and it was all retail terminology, right? Um, baskets, shoppers, passerbys, et cetera. And I was pitching this product and he's like, you know, I don't, I don't need this. I don't really see the value in it. And I'm like, man, how do you not see it? The, um, the, the market is experiential marketing, real world marketing. You have no data of what people are doing in this space. You have nothing. And then he's like, yeah, I don't need it. I'm like, okay. So I go back and this is winter time. And all I literally did was just change the words. I didn't change any fundamental calculation, metric, chart, nothing. It was literally just the words. Mm -hmm. I changed it from passerby to engagement and then shopper to impression and then i put it out there and it's like that's what i need i literally sat down with the same guy two months later it was the identical product which is different labels and he's like that's what i need <laughs> and that sort of was a huge lesson to me i was like man it's it's people can't see the trees through the forest the forest of the trees because they're so enthralled in their world and it's your responsibility to to learn their world right um and that's the biggest thing and uh yeah so that was just one thing i just really wanted to say that was like one cool lesson thanks for sharing um, yeah no for sure um so going back to the the current topic funding so we did um uh when we started like we literally leveraged all the fantastic opportunities available we did um oce there was a couple of programs i don't think exist anymore um entrepreneur fellowship um the smart start program i think still exists and um, we did a couple of those things, which really helped in the beginning. They're small amounts, but they, they add up and they, they really are able to get you sort of get that momentum going. Um, I would say that when we did our first private raise, it was an interesting time 
because I had zero idea if this was a good deal or bad deal um, because it's so subjective, right? Um, that is the, the fundamental nature of VC in, in private investment in general is there is no macro market to define the price. It's what you can derive your value to be based off of, you know, as Sobe and Randy was saying, the story that you can tell and obviously the, the value of the product. Um, so I think that's a huge mental barrier that when people do get to that point of investment, it's going to play in your head a lot. Like, oh, can I get a better deal? Is this something that's really not um, like, you know, for me? But another piece that I would also say is when you do look at um, sort of equity based financing, you, you, you really need to make sure who you're going into bed with um, because they're going to be with you day in and day out. And they will, depending on their level of involvement, will want to have huge control or let you go free. Um, and they might have smart money behind it. So they might be investors within that space that you operate in. So that's what we did. We turned down several investments because we just didn't want the money. We wanted some expertise. Um, so our, um, our private investment was actually done through a very large uh, marketing data aggregator company, which is really cool smart money in the industry and, and really helped us out in that regard. Uh, and then I think the final piece I would say in terms of raising is that you, this is sort of subjective to say, but I don't think you might not always need to, right? Because if you look at a lot of um, utilization for money, it's like, okay, uh, we need space to work. We need the infrastructure and we need talent. Those are like the three sort of pieces that you put together. Marketing usually comes later. Um, you know, sort of the incidentals uh, come later, but the talent, that's who you want to start the company with, right? Choose your right founding partners, choose your right um, core team that you want to, you know, really go into the trenches with. And if you're all on the same page, the very starting team, like, you know, huddle together, right? Um, try to find a really good base that none of you are motivated by money at that point. I know money's there to survive, but as Bailey sort of said, like, hey, you can get a side job, you can go back home. You know, it's not, if you have a roof and food over your head, you're good, right? Um, the second piece is working environments. Like, fantastic, we have the Rires Adventure Zone, but if you don't go into programs like that, I mean, coffee shops exist for a reason. Those things actually are always a, a totally cool spot to start. You don't need a fancy office in the beginning. And then infrastructure and resources. There is so much, um, like I said, in-kind, opportunities that have no need for a term sheet or a presentation or whatever it's an application form you can get ten to a hundred thousand dollars in AWS credits if you're part of a like an incubation zone or something like that right you have all you have Google credits you have so much in kind opportunities where you don't need to go off in the start I think money should be raised when you really do need to scale um, you know, you need to hire that talent. You don't have equity to give out. You know, you're bursting at the seams and now you're taking up half the Starbucks and the burst is like, okay, you got to go. Like that's when you need to start to, to look at that. Um, yeah. Google too early is going to damage you, in my opinion. Ab absolutely. I, I have, uh, I had the good fortune of working with Razor Solomon at Elevate, uh, who's, uh, as you know, uh, a CEO of, uh, of a very large uh, a company that he built in, in the in talent space. And he always says, I wish I had not taken that VC funding uh, when and uh, gave away all my equity, which uh, really hurt his friends and family around. And so it's you have to raise money when you really need it, as you as you mentioned. We have so many free resources from uh, whether it's government funding or other in kind support. And then the key thing that you mentioned about. Um, having uh, strategic investors. Uh, yours is an unusual one, and I know that, that company really well because of my market research background, but that is key. If they are already a potential customer, that is even better um, as an investor versus someone just looking for returns and don't have the strategic connections that, uh, to the customer base. So um, th those are all awesome points. Um, um, I want to take a slightly different, uh, uh, we've talked about resources, funding, we've talked about um, your journey, et cetera. Um, you all have been in this entrepreneurship world for a, for a, for a while and um, it can get very tough. Um, you're all probably very optimist like me and so you are okay with the tough times. Um, 
but working with co-founders through dark times, you know, what is the one thing that you always is a go-to thing to keep your spirits up, uh, to keep going because there are still 77 people still with us at 945 and they want to know how do I continue to be in the business that I am in and wake up every morning and do this. So insp inspirational words from you, uh, uh, each one of you. So maybe we'll go with uh, uh, Sobe first, uh, then Bailey, Randy, then Nate. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to just to just just to get started. Obviously, you have an idea, you have a plan, you have a plan, you have a roadmap, but uh, but you just you just have to have that long term vision, and 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 you don't you can't you can't go over money. Like you have to have a vision, and you know you have to believe in it. So I mean, I was seventeen when I started uh, this company with my older brother and my my partner Anton. So we, we, we knew what we were heading into and, and we had this idea with no money. We actually started from a lab uh, out of York University. Uh, that was our first unofficial WeWork office. <laughs> so, so, I mean, you just have to get started, I would say. Like, don't, don't wait. Start as early as possible and, and, and just, just focus on, your, on, on building your product. Um, that's... And I would how say that's stay, my. How did you stay motivated at that age? I can't even believe that that you started at that age so young. And how did you continue to stay motivated and focused? Is there one? You know, you know, you know, you know. It's 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 really great uh, when you're working uh, with two great co-founders, and one of that being my older brother. So us just being together was a great team, um, and and we kind of motivated each other. And uh, and uh, I mean that's yeah just we just believed in what we were building and what we were doing and what, where we were headed so awesome and you're lucky to have had a found a a, a co-founder that you really knew and therefore you were keeping yourself motivated so i'm sure you have some quirky practices that you're not sharing with us so we but uh we'll leave it at, at that um bailey do you have any words of wisdom how did you keep keep at it Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think uh, I actually might have an interesting perspective because with Skills Camp, we're working quite a bit with companies right now and organizations, schools, potential entrepreneurs. Um, we teach soft skills, but as you can imagine, a lot of what we're doing recently is stress management, community mental health and um, like resilience. And just last week, we did self-awareness. <laughs> How do you keep up the energy when um, basically the world around you is doing what it's doing right now, yep. um, regardless of owning a business in the process. It's also been interesting because I have like, for me as a, as a entrepreneur now, I just don't see it any other way. There's kind of give and take on both sides of the coin, whether you own the business or whether you're working, you know, for someone. Mm -hmm. And I think COVID has kind of, for me, really illuminated the pros and cons of each side of the equation. And for me, you know, there's a lot of my even family just saying to me, like, I can't imagine like what you, I can't imagine, like, if you don't work, you don't make money yet. And I'm like, well, that's not the plan forever. <laughs> like that's just right now. <laughs> but, and they're like, I couldn't handle that stress. And I'm like, well, I couldn't handle someone else deciding if I have a job. Mm -hmm. So that to me is like, and I couldn't handle some, like, it would really bother me if someone was saying like, you weren't available on Slack at 10, 10. Mm -hmm. And I lived that life as well. And the thing is though, the point being though, that they're still looking at me saying, I'm, I'm, they don't like what I've got going on either. So we need both. It's just that in those times where I'm feeling like, like it happened probably once during COVID where I think about the reason why I work so hard and I've got a vision board, you better believe it. And it's very visual and and there's a, it's like travel. I have the privilege of traveling quite a bit in my work regularly for public speaking. And um, that's a big motivator for me, always has been in terms of lifestyle design, being paid to travel. And that's what I do for fun. Basically, I just eat and drink. So I was starting, I got to like one down point where I'm like, why am I working so hard if I can't do any of the things I like to do when I work really hard and make money? 
So I just think about, okay, but the long, this is not going to last forever. And already you can, you can start to go some places, I guess. So I think about that vision board and I think, but what's the alternative? And that kind of motivates me because we all have different ups and downs. Otherwise, if you're listening and you're not one of the potential um, entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs here, I'd say it's, should hire skills camp and do some stress management and resilience work. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bailey. Yes, I, I think that's an important uh, way to think about. I mean, this is, has been a very extremely stressful time, whether you're, uh, you know, working full time or uh, you're a parent uh, full time at home with kids starting school today uh, for everybody. Uh, in, and, and for me, kids going to university, not very happy about this online experience, et cetera. So um, we are dealing with whatever we have. Um, any, any thoughts from you, Randy? What is, the, what is the thing that kept you motivated to difficult times? What is the one thing you do regularly to keep you yourself positive? Yeah, um, you know, motivation, inspiration, drive. I feel a lot of that comes from my family. Um, Brampton being this diverse city of people from different cultures, um, you know, my, my family heritage and lineage goes back to West Africa. And, um, just hearing my parents' stories, right, uh, and learning about their journey and how they've had to sacrifice to essentially just survive to provide a life and opportunity for me to now go and create something that I want to create. So one, that's where my motivation comes from is, you know, they did what they had to do so I could have a choice in what I want to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, I think the, the second thing is, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant talks, well, talked about it a, a lot was you, you need to fall in love with the journey. You need to fall in love with the journey because, you know, goals and plans and, um, visions will alter. Um, but if you focus on being a little bit better than you were the day before, you'll be fine. Right. When, when we break it down uh, on a, on a singular level like that, it allows us to see the world in a, um, progressive as opposed to a, a progressive perspective, as opposed to, um, attaining things, right. Because you could work towards something and may never get there. Um, and it may not be exactly what it is when you first started, but as long as you're working towards something and finding ways to challenge yourself, um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, things will sort itself out, right? You know, they, people talk about the, the harder you work, the luckier you become. I believe in that. The, the more energy you, you, you spend on building relationships with people that are ahead of you in life and people that can, can help you build, will help you get into, into rooms and, and places that will help you <clears throat> uh, continue to chase your dreams and vision. So, you know, my, my words would simply be just find ways to be better than you were yesterday. And when you, when you do it on a, on a smaller level like that, things don't seem as big, right? When you're working on a marketing plan, that could be 26 pages. But if you work on one page a day, mm -hmm. you'll have a marketing plan in a month, yep. <laughs> right? So just taking your time and understanding that mm -hmm. it takes a long time. You know, they talk about uh, the lady that wrote Harry Potter and you hear about her stories and yeah. she was homeless and yeah. it took four years and X amount of books and being told no before she finally got to yes. Yep. She worked on something every day, I would like to believe, to get to where she's at. There's, there's, there's a lot of um, similarities between athletes and entrepreneurs, right? There's, you hear a lot of common things in, in oh, dedication, yes. yeah. focus, yeah. discipline. That's what entrepreneurship is. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the same skills and things that I've, you know, I'm working towards are the same things that I did when I was going to Cardinal Asia in Brampton. Yeah. I wanted to be one of the best guards in Brampton. Yeah. What did that mean? I had to get up and go to the gym, 6 a.m., not shower, then go to school. After school, go back to the gym, work out some more. Yeah. It's the same thing in entrepreneurship. Yeah. It's, it's the same thing in entrepreneurship. Working on a team, collaborating, be able to take 
criticism. It's the same thing. And if I wanted to shoot 90% from the free throw line, I'm shooting 100 free throws a day. Mm -hmm. I'm shooting and working with my teammates. I'm working on my push-ups. I'm running sprints. All of these little things made me a better basketball player. Now, I didn't make the NBA, but I've still been able to do things that I've wanted to do and, you know, be in and around the NBA. So, um, yeah, I, I know I said a lot, but the main thing is just find ways to be better than you were the day before as an entrepreneur. I love that. I uh, and that. Yeah. there's one more thing is you need to take care of yourself. <laughs> as yeah. entrepreneurs, we get so drowned oh, in yeah. our work. And remember, we all wear multiple hats. So if you're working, worrying about accounting one day, marketing another, sales, this, that, and the fourth, and you forget yourself, you can't pour from an empty cup, right? So we need to find time to do our yoga, to work out, to make sure we feel good. Because when we feel good, our productivity actually goes up. We're able to do a lot more when we have energy. When we don't have energy, it's, it's a lot harder to, to think straight and focus and align strategies and ensure that you know we're, we're reaching these goals and trying to find ways to be better. So uh, the entrepreneurial life is, is a challenging life because you're worrying about a vision that supposed to take care of you and you also need to take care of you absolutely so. it is such a key thing i love what uh all the things that you've said um i'm cognizant of time uh but we still have 60 people unbelievable still with us uh, very eager to hear uh hear everyone and i want nate to have his last comments yeah. but i just want to remind everyone um or if you want more information our website is live please go to um, ryerson.ca slash Brampton zone on word. Um, our health and wellness challenge is launching today. So we'd love to see applications from existing startups that are perhaps uh, less than a year old and also uh, new entrepreneurs who are thinking about starting a business in this space and you're passionate about it. Um, uh, subscribe to our newsletters, uh, send us questions if you uh, want to learn more about us and how we are going to uh, be uh, rolling out our programming. Um, we have, uh, uh, we would love to eventually be in person in Brampton uh, when COVID is done. But for now, we will be running everything virtually, but we are here to, to support uh, the other Brampton entrepreneurs. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, before I have Nate do the last comment there, uh, one of the things that I found, one of the things that when you, in your comments, Randy, is that Entrepreneurs also have to be willing to kill the things that they didn't work and not re, you know, wait on, you know, spend and waste time thinking about things that didn't work versus then move ahead, uh, like you mentioned, and being able to kill things and able to move ahead with new opportunities so that, that it doesn't bog you down um, in terms of progress. And then one little incremental uh, things at a time to, to make that progress rather than feeling it as like a mountain to, to climb uh, um, and, uh, to make that progress. So um, some thoughts there. So Nate, last inspirational words from you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll make it short. Um, I mean, I think the biggest thing, like, you know, keeping a good mental well-being, obviously, like, you know, taking care of yourself, everything else. But if you look at, um, the, the way that somebody works in a job. So you go to a job and you have a set list of tasks um, and it's usually confined to a, a, a finite day, so an eight hour window. Um, you genuinely feel, um, we'll call fulfilled or completed at the end of that day. So, you know, if you go into a job and you're an accountant, you work at an accounting firm and you have a client, you have five tax returns you gotta do that day. You do those five tax returns and you're good. Mm -hmm. See, the thing with entrepreneurship though, is that because you define your own marks, your own finish line, your own work hours, um, it's very easy to feel perhaps that you are not doing enough because you don't clearly outline what you need to do. So I think the biggest thing to keep a good mental well-being and to feeling fulfilled and to getting up every day and feeling motivated is to be able to encapsulate what you have to do as though you are your own boss, which you are, but you're also observing and marking yourself on your own performance. So if you're gonna wake up and in your head you have like, like literally, which you always will, a thousand things to do for your business, but you don't put it on a checklist, you don't have it uh, in some way that you could visually see you knocking out these tasks, you're gonna always feel overwhelmed, you're gonna always feel burnt out, and you're never gonna feel like you're doing enough. 
Whereas if you actually start to put it on paper and you say, okay, I have these 15 tasks today. I got to like do payroll. I need to, you know, email this particular client. I got to review, you know, the new uh, functional specifications for our new product. These things on paper and you step back in a month. And if you, if, I love to write it on physical paper because digital checklists, they go away when you check them off. Okay. You write things down in a month. You write them all down every day in your task. And you take a step back 30 days later and you look at that notebook of all those things checked and crossed off. You're going to be really happy with yourself. And that's going to be a great fuel for you to continue to keep on going because you're going to visually see how much you've been able to accomplish in such a, a particular amount of time. Mm -hmm. That's a, a, a simple but very effective way. I do that. I have a, a stacks of notebooks next to my uh, a desk here because I write everything, even though I have digital checklists. Uh, but you know, writing things down helps a lot. Um, you all have been amazing. Thank you so much, panel members, each one of you, for staying longer for 30 minutes and answering all our questions. Uh, you are the reason Brampton is great. And so we will see more of you, hopefully, from all the efforts of Ryerson Venture Zone. Still 47 people here. They just don't want to go home. They just want to keep staying here with us. Uh, and so we had a wonderful time with you guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Please send us emails. If you have questions, uh, join our newsletter, um, go to our website. And if you are in the health and wellness space, please join our challenge today. Thank you very much, everyone. John, do you have any final comments? John, you're, you're on mute, John, again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, just to add my thanks again to everybody for, for joining us in the panel this morning. I, I think, I mean, you, you said a lot of really good things that, that I, I really should show people that if you want to get started, you can get started. You can make it happen in Brampton. There's a lot there that you can build from and a lot of great people that you can tap into uh, like yourselves. And there's others there that, that are willing to step up and help. They've been on the journey. They know what it's like and they can, they can help make that, make it possible for the next there. So we really do look forward to, to making great things happen in Brampton um, with your support, with the support of the community, with the support of the other uh, partners that in the, in the innovation district. So thanks again. Thanks to everybody who's joined us online this morning. And we look forward to hearing from you. Ryerson.ca slash Brampton Zone. Come see us. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.